Hi, my name is Dr. Olivia Ong, known as the Heart Centered Doctor, a Melbourne based rehabilitation medicine and pain physician with 15 years of clinical experience and an expert in resilience and burnout. Today, I'll be talking about five steps to being in the business of being yourself. After being hit by a car in 2008, I was told I'll never walk or practice medicine again. I spent years as a patient in hospitals and rehab facilities in Australia and the US in an attempt to regain some of the capabilities that were torn away from me. Little did I know I was going to get a whole lot more than I had bargained for. After an intensive three-year recovery process, I walked again. Today, I share my experience with others. Emerging from such a dark period in my life inspired me to start a business to address the unspoken toll that doctors bear when they don't find the support they need. As a high performance leadership coach and mentor for doctors, I now run programs helping doctors transform their lives, moving from burnout to balance. And this work has extended to helping now powerful, extraordinary, high performers in various industries to achieve impossible goals without the burnout. Being able to speak from my own unique life experiences gives my presentations a deeply authentic feel and my warm approach has made me a sought after speaker and online educator. I'm the author of The Heart Centered Doctor, which features a foreword from one of my mentors, Jared Canfield, co-author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series and the success principles, how to get from where you are to where you want to be. I also collaborated with Jack Canfield on Soul of Success Volume 3, which won me the Best Sellers Quilly Award from the National Academy of Bestselling Authors in Hollywood for recognition of my authorship and thought leadership. I've also co-authored chapters in the Osmanpreneurs Anthology books, Goodbye Busy, Hello Happy and Ignite. As the founder and CEO of the Heart Center Method Institute, my vision is for my company to be the leading global personal growth and professional development company for physicians so that they can be well-rounded, heart-centered doctors. As a physician entrepreneur, I've been awarded the Disabled Business Excellence Silver Award by the founders of Osmanpreneurs, Peace Mitchell and Katie Gardner for demonstrating my leadership, the resilience and business skills in establishing my company against all odds. I've been featured in and written for Thrive Global, Yahoo Finance, International Business Times Singapore and Australian Business Journal. My media appearances include Sky News, Studio 10 and Ticker TV. And I regularly speak at industry leading events, including Australasian New Zealand College of Anesthesia and Faculty of Pain Medicine on topics such as physician burnout and how mindfulness and self-compassion can transform chronic pain. So now let's talk about the five steps to being in the business of being yourself. A couple of years ago, as I've mentioned, I reached a turning point in my life in the past, 12 years, I had gone from enduring a spinal cord injury, where doctors told me I will never walk again, to relearning how to walk, as you have heard, rebuilding my medical career and having two children. But I was constantly living with fatigue and overwhelm. I had lost sight of who I was beyond being a doctor. I realized I wanted to rediscover the passion in my medical work, restore my mental and emotional well being, and reconnect with my family my inner self, and my identity. In the process of reconnecting with the important parts of my life and myself, I found a renewed sense of purpose and clarity in my mission to help doctors around the world lead the heart-centered life they truly deserve. This period of honing my focus started to take shape when I discovered a number of powerful personal development tools, which helped me get to a place where I was thriving both at home and at work. I learned how to take ownership of my thoughts and gain a whole new perspective on life. I had a fire in my belly 
because I have seen too many of my talented medical colleagues burn out as I had done myself, not once, but twice. So I worked on the problem as diligently as I've ever worked on anything. And I figured out how I could help my peers discover the heart-based tools that had helped me get out of the hole I had been in. I've seen burnout from both sides and I've become passionate about arming my colleagues with powerful tools they can use to rediscover their self-worth and lead the kind of heart-centered life I've been able to establish for myself. I want to help them find that spark of joy and creativity outside the world of medicine and access the freedom to do whatever they want. I also realized that these skills weren't just valuable for medical professionals, but for everyone. And today I'm going to be sharing it with the Osmanpreneurs community. In this presentation, I want to introduce you to a powerful transformation tool that I have developed called the five keys of freedom. This tool personally helped me thrive being in the business of being myself. It helped me to discover my why and it can help you find yours too. And I've decided to embed the five keys to freedom into the five steps to being in the business of being yourself, which are practicing self-care, having a growth mindset, developing emotional mastery, exploring inspired conversations, and applying self-compassion. And let's talk about practicing self-care. As a female physician who is a mom, a wife, spinal cord injury survivor, and an entrepreneur, I was often filling the cups of others before filling my own. But when I was busy serving my family, communities, patients, and teams of medical professionals, I was working with a half-filled cup. I had found emotions like resentment, anxiety, stress, and worry rising to the surface and compromising my effectiveness in all areas of my life. It wasn't until I started taking my well-being seriously that I realized filling my cup needed to be a non-negotiable priority. Self-care isn't selfish. It's about taking responsibility for our own well-being so we are able to be there for other people in our lives. The fundamentals of self-care are not complicated, but they can sometimes seem that way because of the complicated lives so many of us lead. The fundamentals are getting enough sleep, eating nourishing food, and developing fulfilling relationships in our home, the workplace, and the other circles we move in. These fundamentals can be broken down into six key components, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, relationship, and workplace. Now let's talk about the physical aspects of self-care. This includes eating regular healthy meals, drinking plenty of water, taking time off when you are sick. The mental aspects of health self-care includes making time for self-reflection, taking day trips or mini vacations, or having an outlet for creativity, such as creative writing, which I had done. Emotional aspects of self-care include spending time with friends, finding things that make you laugh, loving yourself. Spiritual aspects of self-care includes having a spiritual connection or community, connecting to what is meaningful to you, praying, meditating, or engaging in gratitude practices regularly. I find gratitude practices really helpful uh, in practicing my self-care a deeper appreciation of the good things and bad things that have happened to me have helped me uh, look after myself really well. The relationship component of self-care includes having regular dates with your partner or your kids, calling or visiting your relatives, making time to be with friends. Workplace self-care includes taking time to chat with coworkers, negotiating and advocating for your needs, setting limits with your boss and peers. Now let's talk about growth mindset. Mindset is everything in business, as you all know with money mindset and imposter syndrome mindset. Dr. Carol Dweck is a researcher at Stanford University and the author of Mindset, The New Psychology of Success. She talks about two types of mindsets, growth and fixed. 
A fixed mindset is when we believe the qualities we are born with are carved in stone. The talents and personality traits we are born with are the ones we have for the rest of our life. You might believe you have a fixed amount of intelligence, a cheery or not personality, or high moral character or not. Confirmation bias means that when we have this type of fixed mindset, we'll notice things that prove we are right and filter out those that prove we are wrong. A corollary of having a fixed mindset is that we also believe that there's no point in even trying things we don't think we're any good at because we're convinced we'll fail. A growth mindset is when we believe the qualities we are born with are only a starting point and we can always learn and grow. This is a much more empowering way to think with an attitude driven by the belief that our development in any area of our life can be cultivated as long as we put in the effort to learn and acquire new skills. When I first started my business, I had a fixed mindset. This led me to being a perfectionist, pushing through my fears by working in the business and not on the business. As a result, my business failed. I also struggled with money mindset and imposter syndrome mindset. But once I started approaching things with a growth mindset, exchanging my self-criticism and the need to be perfect in everything for the perspective of curiosity of let's find out why, I was able to find success as a medical entrepreneur. Now let's talk about the third aspect of being in the business of yourself. And that is emotional mastery. The most significant factor affecting our ability to change is the degree to which we accept that we get to choose our emotional state. Doing the work to get into that state of knowing and being changes our behavior, which in turn changes the physiology of our body right down to the biochemistry of our cells. This isn't just about recognizing when we feel happy, angry, or sad. It's about noticing all of our emotions and then using the understanding to make conscious choices about the best course of action, even if that's leaving things alone. As with the sensations we feel in our body, being mindful of our emotion creates practical awareness of the state we're in. This allows us to recognize when we are too close to the edge before we actually topple over it. Imagine shaking up a bottle of carbonated drink and watching the pressure mount. Bottling up our emotions creates a similar kind of internal pressure that takes us right out of the part of our brain that's responsible for making informed decisions and to into the prehistoric part of our brain where our fight or flight instinct takes hold. This is, a, this is an incredibly empowering state when we're being chased down the street by a lion, but not so much when we are having a disagreement with our partner about whose turn it is to do the dishes. There are moments in life that are hard, painful, scary, and difficult to live through. These are the times when we are likely to feel anger, anxiety, grief, embarrassment, stress, remorse, or other unpleasant emotions. In trying times like this, we instinctively look for ways to escape the pain, and this is called blocking. We might try to keep busy all the time or seek comfort in food, drink, or something stronger. We might even get involved in a mental struggle with the pain where we are trying to mentally talk our way out of it. I've experienced blocking in the past when I tried to push through my discomfort using the force of will. Other times, I tried to distract myself by self-medicating with food, online shopping, or constant activity by being busy. But as soon as we stop the blocking behavior, our emotions can come back even stronger. This is especially problematic if the discomfort is a sign that corrective action needs to be taken. And of course, self-medicating can undermine our well-being, which leads to even worse negative side effects. Another way of dealing with negative experiences is drowning. There have been times when I felt as if I was dragged under by my own discomfort. As I became more and more incapacitated by a sense of hopelessness and powerlessness, I literally felt as if I was being subsumed by the weight of my circumstances. But there are better ways of handling things. Awareness and acceptance are powerful tools that make it easy, much easier for us to deal with challenging emotions and circumstances wherever they arise. Simply describing and labeling how we feel 
can decrease the hold our emotions have over us and bring us into a state where our prehistoric instincts aren't running the show. You know, there's nothing wrong with experiencing the whole range of emotions. In fact, that's what life is all about, right? The key is to learn how to move into a more empowered state rather than getting stuck in your painful emotions. As a quick side note, some emotional states come from psychological challenges that require specific professional help. For conditions like deep depression, for example, I recommend you seek help from a healthcare provider or a licensed psychologist. Whatever state you're in at the moment, it's worth taking steps to empower yourself with tools to manage emotionally charged situations. It's rare for someone to go through life without finding themselves in an emotionally challenging space from time to time. And it's always good to be prepared for life's challenges. I mentioned earlier on that relationships are imp an important part of self-care. Other people can also be key to our success in other areas. And so it's important that we take a considered approach to our conversations. In his book, Nonviolent Communication, Marshall B. Rosenberg outlines an approach I find really helpful. The touch points he identifies are, number one, observe. This involves describing the situation without evaluating or judging. Observations are completely objective, like a camera that's recording the situation. Number two, identify a feeling. This means stating how you felt when you observed the situation. Feelings are always related to your body and never involve others. Name the feeling clearly so you can understand how the situation is affecting you. Number three, identify your need or desire. This involves getting clear on what you need or desire from the other person. A need is always about you, not about another, and it's always a basic human quality. Number four, formulate a request. This includes phrasing a specific request positively, speaking kindly, but firmly and clearly with the unnecessary emotions such as sarcasm. This fourth component addresses what we are wanting from the other person. As well as talking to others, this approach will also work if you want to get a handle on your self-talk. That might sound a bit weird, but I recommend you give it a go. It could literally change your life. It certainly changed mine. You can use these steps with a voice inside your head that holds you back or always tells you you're making the wrong decision. Observe and identify your feelings. Identify your need or desire. And then formulate a request for the voice in your head and you'll find success. The fifth step to being in the business of being yourself is self-compassion. Now, you know, Relying on a wheelchair after my spinal cord injury made me realize that I had also been trapped in an invisible wheelchair before my injury. I'm not alone. A lot of people are paralyzed and living their life in an invisible wheelchair. They might be stuck in a job they hate, trapped in a loveless marriage, stuck in unfulfilling relationships due to people-pleasing, or other situations that might limit their happiness and fulfillment. When I was in the wheelchair and suffering after my injury, I realized I needed to develop self-compassion, and so the wheelchair ended up being a source of my freedom. Dr. Kirsten Neff is one of the leading experts in the science of self-compassion. She describes self-compassion through three key pillars. Mindfulness, common humanity, and self-acceptance and self-kindness. Now let's talk about the first pillar of self-compassion, which is mindfulness. Mindfulness encourages us to acknowledge our pain and suffering and experience our emotions without suppressing or exaggerating them and observing our emotions with mindful awareness, just as they are. This helps us avoid getting swept up in unhelpful cycles of negative reactivity. The second pillar of self-compassion is common humanity. Often when we are suffering, we feel isolated. It's helpful to recognize that all humans suffer and we are all imperfect. Rather than being isolated, we are participating in a shared human experience through suffering. And the third pillar of self-compassion is self-acceptance and self-kindness. Now, the key is to be kind and gentle with ourselves when we face suffering, whether it manifests through failure, imperfection, or challenges outside our control. 
It's helpful to accept these things as a normal part of the human experience rather than fighting against them and becoming angry, frustrated, or self-judgmental. Through these tools, I was able to build my life from life-threatening injury and burnout back to a place where I had a family I loved, including my two young children and a job I enjoyed. In fact, multiple businesses I enjoyed. I believe that through these skills of self-compassion, we can all learn to respect ourselves and build our self-worth. In summary, let's talk about the five steps to being in the business of being yourself. Number one, practicing self-care. This means taking care of your well-being by getting enough sleep, eating nourishing food, and developing fulfilling relationships. Second step is having a growth mindset. A growth mindset is, is an inspiring attitude where we believe the qualities we are born with are only a starting point and we can always learn and grow. The third step to being in the business of being yourself is developing emotional mastery. When we are truly aware of all of our emotions, we are able to make better business decisions. And, the, and for the fourth step to being in the business of being yourself is, is exploring inspired conversations. By taking a more considered approach to our conversations, where we are more objective about how we're feeling and what we're seeking, we can have much more successful conversations. And the fifth step to being in the business of being yourself is applying self-compassion. Through being mindful of our emotions, recognizing humanity's shared suffering, and being kind and gentle with ourselves, we can gain freedom from self-judgment, and these are the five steps to being in the business of being yourself. If you'd like to know more information about this topic and how it may affect you or your team, please email me at hello at dralivialeong.com or connect with me on LinkedIn at Dr. Olivia Ong. Thank you for listening to my presentation today. It has been an honor to facilitate this workshop today. I'll encourage you to live your love and be your own best friend. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.